just run. Yeah. So give everyone uh, maybe five more minutes or so to to settle. If everyone wants to go ahead and add their, there we go. Look at that. John's adding his name in. If you want to add your attendance on the the Google Doc, which I can post into the chat here, just a sec. Let me grab the URL to make it easier. Uh, chat, 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 chat. There's the chat. There we go. The mad frenzy is everyone overwrites everyone else to enter their names at the top. Wow, I'm seeing Hotmail. <laughs> I used to be a big fan of Hotmail sometime back. <laughs> Pratik is, is our, our vintage uh, contributor here. <laughs> I, I would think he was steampunk, but sure. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's more of a, a, you know, all the gears and wires and everything, decorating your clothes and that kind of thing. Uh, better. Ed, I sent you a quick uh, a link to the um, poll for the review comments. So once uh, you're fine, I can probably publish it. Not sure whether you got that in email. Oh, I, I did. I, it just by the time I got to it, it was so close to the meeting. It seemed sure. like yeah. we talk about it here. Because um, yeah. I, I think the, the fundamental thing we're trying to get a sense of is, you know, is there literally no time that can work? And in which, which case, we go back to the drawing board, right? All right, All right. So, cool. Yeah, and frankly, that that item has been on the list for a month. And last week, I had suggested that this was the yes. this was its last chance to be on the agenda. <laughs> I saw your comments, and I thought probably let's uh, probably have some momentum to that. Is what I thought, and then I created a Google yeah. Doc. Yeah, let's do a uh, Google Calendar. Sorry, poll. Yeah, we'll, we'll totally we'll totally get to that. I think we've got an item in the agenda yeah. for it, I think. So, right. cool. Does someone want to drop a reminder in the IRC channel, just in just? Uh, That's a good plan. That's a good plan. Hang on. Yeah, yeah. Just to uh, just to give everyone a chance there. I have too many IRC channels. I know. <clears throat> One second, let me get the right link. Are we missing anyone specifically? I don't see Frederick here. Yeah, let me let me call some folks out here. Um, if I call you out and you are here, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Well, I think we should get started. Mm -hmm. So I think we will. Uh, so if you're not looking at the, the Google Doc with the agenda and everything, I posted it into the chat for the meeting. It's also directly on the Network Service Mesh Repo um, website, or excuse me, GitHub page as well. 
So I think we usually like to start with, uh, as Ed likes to surreptitiously call it, agenda bashing. So there we go. So feel free to, to scroll through. I think today we'll cover AIs from last week. We'll go through recent development activity, uh, use case map, mapping. The last, uh, the last time we'll see meeting time planning on the agenda, action items, and then a conceptual review. If anyone wants to add anything, uh, feel free to speak up now or... Uh, if you do add something, definitely mention it now so we, you know, so we can get there. Okay. Otherwise, I think we'll just jump right in and we'll kind of review action items from, from last week. I see Frederick has joined. Um, all I did was I just went through last week's meeting minutes and I just grabbed the action items in the order that they were that they were uh, mentioned uh, in in the agenda. So there's, so so Frederick, uh, you had an action item to enable the wiki and GitHub and, and the documentation there. Is there is there any update on that? So the wiki is online. Um, there's nothing on it yet. So we need to start populating it. Um, and also I was thinking about it uh, while, while I was enabling it, um, a thought came to mind. Um, the thought is that perhaps like we, we do want to keep some information on the wiki, but uh, if there's something that's version specific, like it's part of the, how do you use it or API specific related stuff, then that should probably go within the um, within the repository as well. Uh, because if someone's using, let's say we have like two versions that uh, that are that are in use. Let's say version like one and version two that are not fully compatible, but uh, people are building on top of them. And we'll need to be able to do version specific API and version specific documentation. So, uh, so I think that we're still we're still going to need to have some documentation on the um, the as well. But for main concepts. I think that the main concepts and and the information about like how does uh, how does Kubernetes uh, like how do how do CRDs work or so on? You know, I think that that information can live in the main uh, in the main wiki. Things that are cross cutting across. So um, those were my thoughts on it. But that, that's yeah, definitely good. Just, hey, uh, Billy McFall, could you mute yourself, please? There is like a giant fan running in the background that's cutting out. Thank you. Oh, so much better. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I think I, I, I totally get what you're saying, Frederick. And, and, uh, and I, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with what you're discussing here. Yeah. I, my, my experience has been in this, this, you know, basically we're at the right point, frankly, for what we're doing right now, which is wikis are really easy to edit. And so they're great as you're just trying to document shit as you get going. Um, as, as projects mature, wikis turn into terrible actual documentation. And so, you know, eventually you get to a point where you do real, real adult docs for the project. But I, I don't think we're quite to the point where we need to put energy into that right now. And so, Wiki is probably the right way. Yeah, we can always migrate as well. Like it's oh, absolutely, exactly. With the Wiki, just just for those who are not familiar with GitHub Wikis, they're just uh, they're they're just a secondary Git repo, and we can we can pull things out of that easily and stick them into a uh, documents directory in the main repo when we choose to do so. so. Yeah, that, that is nice. And I like some of that integration between the wiki and, and, and the repo as well, like referencing issues and PRs fairly automatically and things like that becomes relatively pain-free. Yeah, I'm just gonna take a note. Cool. Excellent. Thanks, Frederick. Any other any other comments, uh, questions, or concerns on on you know utilizing the wiki for some initial documentation as we go here? Okay. So the next action item we had pulled out was uh, was John. Uh, you had an action item as documented here to crisply express the invisible network and via problems to the mailing list and or during the meeting this week. Well, didn't do it. I started, <laughs> I started playing the code yesterday and Frederick and um, 
Kyle helped me get started. So let me do a little more of that. And then after that, I shall add some comments. It was mainly around, you know, how do we integrate with service mesh? Or what is our position with service mesh in it? Are we an invisible network or are we another network with service mesh? How do we tie that together? Makes sense. Well, do you want me to, to have this AI? Sorry, when I saw invisible yeah. network on okay. the ML. Oh, go ahead, Prem. Yeah, sorry. When I saw the English ML, I thought it's machine learning. My bad. <laughs> I read ML as machine learning. <laughs> We, yeah, we're we're, not, we're, we, we may be hip, but we're not that hip yet, Prem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the last one, the last action. Oh, John, I, I think that's, that, that sounds really good. Yeah, and, and definitely as, you know, as we can help you um, as you go along here, that's totally, that, that's totally great. So we'll look, we'll look forward to, to that next week then. Okay, yeah, thanks. And then we had uh, the use case document. I know I myself um, have not commented or provided feedback. I don't know if, if anyone else has this week as well. Chris sent an email this morning, so we had some feedback. But I think it I think it'd really help everybody if we, as I said, an email. I mean, even just like I don't understand this is good because then we can actually add add more content or this is not clear. Yeah, those type of comments are really helpful. I think. Fram, what do you think? Yep, uh, I felt Chris' uh, comments uh, uh, pretty useful and started <laughs> editing it based on his comments. So, yep. <clears throat> okay, so we'll move this to the uh, mailing list and not the machine learning algorithm for. <laughs> I like that. Okay, well, I would machine, probably... if machine, if machine learning can solve it. We should, we should actually use it. Well, that's true. To be fair, if it can solve it, then I think we might want to look at that. Yeah, I will probably pull an ad for that because he made me think on those lines uh, after our discussion about uh, uh, on demand, uh, on demand channels or on demand uh, VXLAN channels. So, sorry. <laughs> We had okay. Uh, we and, had a little uh, bit of background uh, noise there. If you're if you're not talking, it would be excellent to to, to go on mute. Uh, excellent. Okay. He is talking on mute. Oh yeah, he is. Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah, yeah. As you were on mute. Oh, so I'm sorry about that. Um, no, I, I was going to comment. Um, you know, in response to Krem's comment, like I, I am cooking some sort of trying to communicate some other ideas. I've got some preliminary stuff that is really not fully baked but it's all being done in the open. So there's literally a network service mesh folder um, that, that all of you can read and so forth. And, and that's literally when I pick up a pen, that's where I pick up a pen. So like some of the stuff that, that Prem was talking about with sort of network service mesh wirings and things like that is there. But it's certainly not baked. So, you know, so, really and, uh, so I've added that as part of the use case. Uh, for, for <laughs> that's awesome, Prem. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay, dude. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So I, I suggest. Uh, uh, so so thanks, uh, John, for pointing it out, and Chris for starting the discussion. I, I haven't looked at that this morning yet on the mailing list, but but yeah, let's let's see what we can do on the mailing list this week with this with this discussion and see what we can wrap up. And then uh, you know, I'd like. I think we should propose if we can do that, we'll we'll do another AI to wrap this up next week in the meeting because presumably we'll have had a lot of discussion on the mailing list this week and we can follow up with things that aren't clear or points that people want to make or, or things like that. Does that sound good to everybody? Yep. Excellent. Okay. So we'll keep moving along in the agenda here. So I thought, you know, we usually do a section now on review of development activity. Um, um, so I, I wrote these, so Frederick, if you're okay, I'll, I can lead this section this week. I, I filled all this in this morning. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, yeah, I, go for it. Okay. So I first of all, at the end, but yeah, go for it. Oh yeah. Go ahead and add it at the end. If you want in the agenda while we're going through the top part or, or, or whatever you're, you're good with. So, um, so I thought I would welcome, we had new contributors this week. I thought it would be interesting to, to kind of put those in. So. 
critique, and uh, I, I'm going to perhaps butcher Sir Gui's name. Ed, do you know how to pronounce Sir Gui's name? Did I get that right? I, I, if, you're, if you're asking me for pronunciation help, we're all doomed. We're all in trouble. Okay, so I apologize. <laughs> but, but welcome to the new contributors that had some... some... Half the time I can't pronounce Ed right, and it's a single syllable. That's true. So the other thing I did was I, I, have these, I have these handy links that I'll try to put up, keep updated. So for example, this one should, if I did this right, you can see the issues that were closed this week. Um, so you can get a sense for, for kind of what's being closed. And then I added another one for, for pull requests that were merged in the last week as well. So, so there, there is work happening. We can see code in all of its glory being, you know, reviewed and pushed around and merged and everything. So I think that's, that's pretty good. So if people want to get a sense for what, what's being worked on, that there. Um, so ongoing work, uh, there was, at this point, I think we only have three pull requests open. And if, if anyone is working on something that's not here that you haven't done, a, definitely feel free to add it below this and we can get to it. But there was the issue last week we discussed deletion of CRDs. So I have a patch for that. Uh, thanks to uh, Pratik and Frederick for reviewing that. Um, I think I've addressed all of their comments except for the refactoring one, uh, which, which Frederick, I had proposed on that, that PR that I, I could push a refactoring one after this merges if you're okay with that. But this, this should correctly handle the, the deletion case for us. Um, so that, so hopefully, hopefully we can get that, uh, resolved today yet, but we'll see. Um, the other one I, I was working on was, was integration tests. So I have a pull request out for that, which essentially fires up a mini cube in, in Travis at this point and verifies that, that all of our sample YAML files, which contain network service objects, network service endpoint objects, and network service, network service channel objects, all of those can actually be created and then viewed, um, and, and all of that works. So once PR72 merges, we'll be doing some integration testing um, as part of our Travis runs as well. So if, if people are interested, it would love to get some, some feedback on that one as well. And then the last one was uh, Sir Gouye pushed PR79 this morning around uh, unit tests for CRD validation as well. And he's looking for, he pinged me this morning and indicated he was looking for some feedback on the approach there as well. So does anyone have any other ongoing work? I know Frederick, you had mentioned that there was something you wanted to discuss here. So the floor is yours if, if, you're, if you would like to discuss it now. Or anyone else actually. Okay, so yeah, just a, um, a couple other things that we should start working on. Uh, so I noticed that this is something I noticed from just working a large number of Git repos. Uh, so when you're working in, or on Go, Go project specifically, uh, when you're working in Go, one of the issues that people run into is the, uh, is how do you set up your initial development environment? And how do you integrate with the deployment or the uh, dependency tools properly as well? So, uh, so we need to we need to work out a way to uh, minimize some of these issues uh, that we have. So, for example, if you if you put your your repo in the wrong spot in your Go path, or it's not in a Go path, and then you try running dep on it. Uh, then you sometimes can get some weird uh, stuff going on with it. So in terms of how it builds, how it generates code, uh, it, it, you end up generating code that ends up in the wrong package or, or, uh, or even worse, you vendor your own repo and then some you of self-vendoring. That's yes, self-vendoring. Self so, so which means it, which is, which silently works at first until you try changing an interface, and then your IE says, "Yeah, there's no problem with this." You check it in, and it, it explodes. And so, <coughs> I think we do have a check that prevents self-vendoring from actually passing CI right now, though, don't we? I hope so. Uh, I I, re I recall pointing it out. Uh, I, I I think we do. Yeah, Ed, you added something a while ago on that. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I did. I did. And, and, and the thing is, I guess what may be a good idea is, is and this is a good thing for a wiki, frankly, um, is the sort of ways you can hurt yourself uh, and how to recognize when the CI is telling you that you've done them. Um, you know, I, I do vaguely recall from putting in the self-vendoring stuff that there was an attempt to try and make the error messages really, really self-explanatory because I, I, I have a personal thing against error messages that says, bad thing happened and doesn't tell you anything else um, about what to do now. Um, but well, what I was going to recommend as well is we, we do two things. Number one is we, we document as well as we can. And every time I get a new user who has problems with it, once they fix it, then their job is to update the wiki in a way that they would have understood uh, until no one, start, no one asks that question anymore. The, the second thing is we need to add into the build script uh, when you do, um, when you run the build uh, locally, uh, just a, a sanity check the test to see whether you're in the, the correct uh, uh, location in the, in the go path in order to, uh, in, in order to work. And if not in it, then uh, it does, instead of just sending out an unhelpful error message, we just print nothing. No, we, we print out a uh, look. <laughs> We print out a path to the wiki as to where they can where they can learn how to set up their, how to set up their environment. I'm 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 still really tempted by printing nothing just for a moment. Um, I'll I'll get over it, but but still. Um, so so this these are all these are all super good ideas, and I have completely failed in writing some of them down in the meeting minutes, and I'm going to try to do that now. So that's okay. I'll, I'll get I'll get them. Okay, you got it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I've also just dropped a link, in, uh, an example of self-documenting error in the build sh, um, where basically it, it dies for what even if you're reading the script is probably an obscure reason, um, and and then it it basically says do this to fix your problem. Okay. Um, you know, it, it essentially you know it, it it dies because of the vendoring issue, um, and then it it tells you how to fix it. Yeah, and part of uh, and part of my plan as well is to is to try to eliminate these kind of roadblocks that prevent people from joining in the first place. So mm -hmm. if uh, if anything like this comes up, uh, you know, definitely feel free to contribute towards it uh, or uh, contact contact me, and I'll help come up with a uh, uh, with a way to mitigate some of these some of these issues. So especially if it's around how dependencies work or go related tooling or anything like that, like definitely definitely get a hold of me. Yeah, I just brought another example. If you if you muck up Go format, which is also a deeply mysterious thing, uh, if you don't know what's going on, it, it tells you exactly what to do. Yeah, hey. Thanks to Fre Frederick for helping me because I had I had think I think I had all of those problems. <laughs> oh, which I uh, you yeah. did. You did. I feel like this whole discussion was a roundabout way to give John more action items to update, <laughs> which, which I, kudos I, I, to Frederick for, for subtly getting <clears throat> John another AI. One thing, one thing I noticed was, now that I have it working, is I'm, I'm trying to run it on GKE, and the cluster roles, the create permissions for the... Um, The authorization, the RBAC stuff needs to be set. So I'm having to go through and get that set up in our environments. On Minikube, I assume it's just default. Yes. Yeah. So is it possible? So if you end up needing like a separate YAML file for GKE for, with some of that role stuff. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think I need a separate, separate YAML okay. file. I think you should go set the IAM roles in your, G, in your GKE account. Ah, uh, that's what, okay. So that, that would be another wiki thing then that we could yeah. document on here. Cool. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So I like once it. I figure it out, I'll, I'll pop it in. I like yeah. it. But I think it's, and I'm sure AWS and Azure will have the same futzing. That's, that's likely the case. I think, so as well. yeah. <laughs> you so, know, you know, uh, you know, honestly, like, so John, for this type of stuff, we're running it on, uh, I, I may even swing to just, pushing down the markdown file into the repo with how to run this on, on GKE, for example, um, you know, rather than the wiki initially, I don't know. I, I well, let me get it working and I'll yeah. have, I'll get, I'll 
capture the G Cloud um, yeah. CLI and then any IAM stuff out of Futsworth. So we at least have okay. a one way of doing it. I'm sure there's probably, there's probably not a. I mean, one thing I would also really strongly commend if possible, mm -hmm. and it's not always possible, is you know, if, if basically you can get the how to you know, detect error, how to fix error in the same place in whatever script people are running. Whenever you can do that, that's golden because it becomes the world explodes. Brief message about how to make the world stop exploding. Yes, exactly. Okay. That's the best if you can do it. You can't always. Cool. Yeah, so uh, since we're talking about that particular space as well, uh, so with the uh, mini cube that was that was uh, discussed earlier, or I don't know if we discussed it or not, maybe I think we just have, uh, but with, with work, with the integration stuff, um, one of the things that we need to check with Minikube is, is it possible to pick the, uh, the CNI plugin, the, the SDN, and inject it into, into Minikube? And the reason, the reason for this is that when people are developing, they're going to want to develop against their own SDNs yep. uh, to, to test. And I'm not sure if Minikube has the ability to inject an SDN in. So, uh, which may be problematic from a, from a testing side. You know, for a start, you don't want to run VPP. If it doesn't give you an easy way to inject VPP into it, then we're going to, we're going to run into problems. And so, uh, if it doesn't, then uh, there's a couple other approaches we can, we can try out. One of them would be to run the cube admin uh, commands directly. And we can then drop in any CNI configuration that we want, which would specify the SDN, uh, and see if we can try to get that. If we have enough privileges in uh, in Travis, and I assume we do, uh, then that that may be an option to uh, to get an initial uh, to get an initial test uh, working with with VPP or. Uh, or some other driver. Yeah. Well, I think that's actually a good point. And the other thing is, I, you know, as we get a little further into that, because for development, it's great. Uh, it's probably the case that, as you said, we want to make sure that we, we are open to testing across whatever sort of CNI or SDN people want. So that when, as we're doing development, because the goal is to support multiple uh, different approaches to the data plane, um, that we can get something that prevents us from, you know, not, from, you know, from unknowingly breaking one data plane or another as we're going through this process. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely agree as well. It, it, it appears like, I because I looked at this previously, I think Mini, Minikube does support CNI, so, so we should be able to do it there. But, but having said that, I agree that we definitely want to make sure that, that Cube ADM, that we, can, that we have some testing for that method as well, and that we can, we can utilize that too. Well, to be more to be more accurate, um, CNI will be present in Minikube, but can you change the CNI driver? And that's that's really the, the question. So that's that's something that we we need to to look into. And and the reason for changing it is unless unless you're okay doing everything with the default driver, which might be flannel, or it might even be a might even just be a Linux bridge that it drops things into. Uh, then we probably want to be able to, to, to change it out, even just for our own default. So, uh, so we, we need to add that as, a, as an action item, basically. Yep, I just I did that there. So we should open up an issue, and, and someone can take that and explore this and then report back on the issue if that's possible or not. So, Yeah, it's, it should be a pretty easy task. So, yep. um, and so if someone wants to, to grab that, otherwise we'll, we'll, get, we'll definitely get to it. But, um, I was thinking and, about at some point we may also want in a similar vein, Frederick. You may also want to explore, um, you know, using using a different uh, runtime other than Docker as well, right? Yeah, although that for me that's probably lower on my on my priority list, but yeah, that. I think that that's definitely that's definitely a good idea. Uh, the main thing w when it comes to that is that the network namespace is discoverable and and accessible, and as long as that is, then you know we should we should be good to go. And it should be pointed out. I did verify it's discoverable and accessible in Docker. 
because that was the that was the thing that occurred to me as being um, yeah. an immediate thing that could go wrong and make all of this incredibly hard. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, and and in terms of the yeah, it's it's easy to discover when in Docker, and the other thing that's um, that's easy to look for as well is when you spin up a pod, the first thing it does is it's, it's it spins up a dummy pod called pause, P A U S E. And then all other containers that need to use that network, uh, that, that namespace, uh, then reuse that particular pause. And that allows you to have restarts without losing the, uh, the, the, the state or allows you to add multiple pods or multiple containers on top of that. Um, <laughs> And without jeopardizing the uh, the network speak of the main one. So as long as we can discover that the, the namespace of that pause, and um, then we're then we're then we're good to go. And that's 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 not difficult to do. Uh, you know, even if you don't have any Kubernetes access, you can always do Docker PS and and work it out programmatically. So. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I don't want to take too much more time on uh, on the. That, that was on one of the changes we we're trying to get into the device plugin, because the allocate call if you return the container ID, you can get the namespaces. Without that, you got to do a bunch of futzing. There's no, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, you play a little regex dance. It's. Uh, it's not fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, it's. It, it's doable but it's not it's, it's not using public apis yeah so yeah if you if you if you see a public api hit uh, hit uh, that gives us this information you know by 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 all means like that's that's definitely let's definitely use that well i think we should lean on you know it's one of the things we need to lean on the device plugin group for we, there's other people leaning on it, leaning on them for it. So it's not a, it's not just us. But I think um, having more people lean on them. Okay, d different action, different action item, and this actually should be an action item. Is that we voice support for it uh, publicly? Support yes. for, I apologize, I'll briefly discussed for which thing? I was briefly distracted. To get yeah, the namespaces, to get the namespaces from the container. We need to get the container ID. No, we don't. Okay, how do you do it? Yeah, so let me. So here's the thing. I've actually gone through and I can reconstruct it given 10 minutes and started up a Docker container. From within a Docker container, you can go phishing and proc to find out your namespace. You can then get that namespace from within the Docker container translated back to a name. You've got to get the, you've got to get the Docker container first. You've got to get the container ID first. Right. Right. That's no, the no, problem. You, you have to be in the container, but you don't have to get the container ID first. Yes, but you're not in the container. You're in the, you're in the daemon set. No, no, but the, we, we get that information from whatever is sending the, the connection request call to the NSM. Right, so we, we don't, this is part of the reason that the NSM was done this way, is there's a ton of information, you know, there's a ton of problems that people are having that they're trying to push in various places that we literally don't have. Um, because of the way the architecture is built. So the fact that you've got someone from inside the pod making the call of the NSM saying, please give Yeah, there's me. definitely information in the, in the container as well, and that, that is an option. We can, we can pull information from the container itself, and we can add it as part of the, as part of the uh, plugin. So we don't, have to, we don't have to rely on any special tooling or anything within the, the so it, it, it to perfectly to lovely that information. Yeah. We can just encode it directly into... Uh, into yeah. uh, the into the service mesh or into the network service mesh. So that, yeah, that's, that's definitely that's yeah, definitely it, true. It, it may be that it's a perfectly lovely and good thing that would be wonderful for the universe. It's just not a thing that's in our critical path. Um, you know, and, and and a lot of that was intentional. I, I spent a lot of time looking at like what you know, when putting the architecture together. I put a, spent a lot of time thinking about not having to go ask for changes of unknown timelines in order for shit to work, um, and. I think, and of course one discovers as one codes, but I think that we actually work just fine with zero changes um, to the system. Um, somebody, if you're gonna handle physical objects that have to be returned, is eventually gonna have to fix the deallocate problem in the device plugin, but, but, and that would be beneficial to us, but I don't think we're by any means the most important people who care about that problem, so. Yeah, so, um... 
action item for Ed, then uh, outline that path in the wiki. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> nice one, nice one, Frederick. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can definitely go ahead. But yeah, it, it's definitely definitely something I had thought about as a problem uh, because otherwise you do have to go and get all kinds of new holes poked in the wall through various paths. And, and I know that from what I've been reading from the people who actually seem to be gatekeeping on the device plugin stuff, they seem really leery to be passing what they deem unnecessary data around, so. Yeah, now, now that you bring it up, I remember having this conversation in length with you about whether we could get the namespace um, yeah. or not, and we explored different paths. I, I did the mechanical exercise, I just didn't write it down. So please do write down the action item um, to make sure that I actually do write it down this time. Because I've done the exercise twice now, and this is about to be the third time. Um, so apparently the only bit I'm retaining in my head is that the solution exists. Yeah, so the, the third, um, I guess, the, we, we need to make sure we have time for use cases as well. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring any other things up because I could do this all day. So. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> right. Frederick, uh, uh, question. Um, so which FDM company do you intend to probably put it in as a first? Uh, is it going to be uh, like ODL or something? Sorry, like your, your volume is pretty low. Can, can you... Oh, sorry. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, so, question is about the SDN controller on the on uh, that you're planning to get it in. Which SDN controller are you planning to uh, start with? So, so there's a couple. There, there's there's two areas on this. Number one is what do we what do we test against, mm -hmm. and the second one is. How do we set it up so that people can test against the SDNs that they uh, that that they want to test against? And specifically, we want to make sure in the long run that we have a set of integration tests that uh, people can can run to tell whether or not their SDN uh, works or works or not. And of course, with some there have to be some options because, like, suppose you have a, an SDN that doesn't support uh, VXLAN for some reason, then of course that test path doesn't make sense, but an auto, auto negotiation that avoids that uh, would. So, but um, yeah, I think, I think right now uh, because of the, the makeup of the, of the team, uh, I think that getting VPP in the path just for the initial set of testing is probably going to be uh, is, is probably going to be the best, but I want to be a bit careful with this because okay. uh, one of the there's a, there's an important part on on optics, and I've I've drilled this into Ed over and over again, uh, <laughs> is that we want to be careful not to be seen as like this is a DPP subproject or uh, or a Legato subproject. It's a project that uses Legato. It's a project that has support for VPP, but is not part of those projects and is trying to be part of a bigger, part of a bigger ecosystem. So, um, so, part of, so part of that is, is ensuring that we have a path to enable those, uh, uh, those use cases and to enable people who want to bring their SDNs to, to, easily, to easily join and get their yeah. System this is, I, I, I am emphatically in agreement here. And, and, and basically, it is really crucially important that we have support for multiple ways of doing the data, flat, data plane. Um, and the sooner we get to that, that multiple path support, the, the more confident we will be in the fact that we actually do that successfully. Right? Um, my experience has been when you have a system where you're supposed to be able to plug in um, different implementations of a thing, until you get that second implementation, you don't really know whether you've done that right or not. Um, yeah, and I, I think we have, because of the people that we have, Ed having this very strong influence over the VPP and the, and the... For those of you who aren't aware, I'm the TSC chair at FIDO, among many other things. So I, I am personally very close to the VPP community. Um, but I also understand that for open source projects to be successful, you can't go welding shit to shit, right? You've got to actually truly be open. Right. And in fact, Ed, uh, I'm in this project mainly because of VPP. <laughs> so, 
So I say no, this is, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's all yeah. okay for people to be VPP fans. Right. Right. So okay. well done. Yeah. yeah. So 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 one sorry, sorry to digress. Uh, question is, uh, um, question is, my assumption is uh, that the uh, NSM uh, itself would have a. Uh, would have the intelligence or the control plane part in this uh, uh, in this uh, journey and probably sdn would just uh, uh, augment it with uh, additional information um, uh, is that right i tend to see the nsm as the the local control plane um, mm -hmm. you know, basically it's not like the great control plane in the sky because i i think that you know, as a matter of personal technical opinion and people are absolutely allowed to disagree with me that, that you have to be very cautious with great brains in the sky because they often scale poorly. And so I tend to think of the NSM as the local control plane running on each node, mm -hmm. which is not to say we won't discover something where we need a great brain in the sky as we go along. I just haven't thought of anything yet where we need one beyond sort of the store CRDs and Kubernetes thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I think, yeah, so so real real short on that, uh, VPP I think is a is a good path. But ultimately, my what I what I see it's trying to do is it's it is trying to aggregate some information about uh, about its domain, but ultimately it needs to pass that information. Uh, it needs to pass enough information up to uh, to the SDN in order for the SDN to do its its work as well. So you can think of it as like you know, like how uh, processors have coprocessors, maybe we can think of it as like a co-control plane or something similar to that, that gives yeah. you this extra ability. I, I, think, I think quite honestly, the way I've been thinking about it, please note, it's not the only way to think about it, is as we're building out the NSM, you know, we're building it out as a series of plugins. And effectively, the, you know, we, there will come a point where there is the, the plugin that talks to the data plane. And whether that plugin is talking to the data plane directly, we're talking to some NSM that's some SDN that's talking to the data plane. Um, you know, I, I think we need to be able to support multiple plugins that talk to the data plane, um, and and we need to be pretty agnostic as to whether we're just locally manipulating a data plane or asking some SDN to do it for us. I'm going to point out that we have about 17 minutes left on the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, this has definitely been a really good discussion. And I think everyone's, I think these are all really good, good points. We do have a few items left. So should we, should we continue with the agenda at this point? So one thing I did want to make sure, um, since, especially since we're dropping it off the meeting today, I would like to make sure that we, we touch on the meeting time planning thing. Yeah, that we want to do there. That's that's what I was thinking. We would jump to that yeah. next before getting into these other things. Um, cool. Yeah. So so Prem, did you, you you had mentioned this earlier in the meeting? Would you like to talk about the meeting time planning? Yes. Uh, so I just created a, a simple Google poll. Uh, I just sent it to Ed uh, to see if uh, I need to add something. Um, so just three simple questions. One is uh, the time zone from where the participant is dialing. Second thing is. Um, whether you're open for uh, altern alternating the calls, meaning between mornings and uh, evenings. And the third one is basically I've picked up uh, a few um, time slots based on, on the, the previous history. Um, so I'm going to send out that poll once uh, head, out, or head provides the feedback. Yep. I, I did want to actually check in with one other thing. Mike, you were going to try and find people who concretely have the, the problem with the current time slot? Yes, I've tried. I, I don't, he asked me. I, I did try prodding a colleague who, mm -hmm. um, if you haven't heard from him, I guess he hasn't picked up I, interest. I don't think so. Because I mean, one of the other options we may want to add to the poll is, so th this whole conversation started because Mike brought up the, the issue quite rightly, um, that Friday is a weekend for some people, right? And, and we all know that international scheduling of all kinds is, is complicated and, and problematic. Um, and so Prem being, you know, being Prem, stepped up immediately to volunteer to do a poll that didn't have Friday on it. And, and so one of the things we do have to decide as a community is, um, is this time slot working for us? And do we want to move it um, off of its current time slot? Um, you know, th that's something we need to talk about. I don't think we have anyone concretely right now who has a problem. Um, but, you know, if we, if, you know, we do need to decide what we're going to do there. Uh, right. it, it just Friday's work 
Yeah. That's exactly right. In fact, one of the options has to be to keep things as they are. <laughs> we don't want to change something just for the sake of changing it. Yeah, but simultaneously, we may be missing out on people who are not here right now because the time is not good. And they're, they're not here to voice their, their opinions. And so... A absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm definitely, you know, we definitely need to make that happen. But, 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 but on the other hand, as you know, I, I, and, and I will, I am, all, you know, like, for example, we've been talking about this for four weeks and I know Mike's been trying to get someone who says they want to come, but can't come. If after four weeks of trying to get that person to indicate to somebody like when they can attend and everything, and we don't hear anything at some point, we just move on. Yeah. Kyle's right. We have to have, keep it the same as an option. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have a problem with keeping it the same as an option. Just, yeah, um, yeah just we, we we should make sure that uh, we have a venue that people who are not here can can see it, which should be the mailing list. I hope. Yes, that's that's fine. Go ahead and send it. As far as I'm concerned, that's that's fine. Yeah. So I I think the 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 one the way you put it together, Prem, did not have keeping things the same as an option, but yes. I imagine you could do it easily. Cool. Yeah. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the poll with, do you want to keep the meeting uh, same? If no, then I'm going to provide them the options. Cool. Excellent. Okay, I had a few updates to the use case document. Uh, I can probably wait until we incorporate or we listen, listen for the review comments and then we can have it uh, uh, incorporated and we can have a final review. Should we do that? So, so basically, we'll because we have the previous AI to have everybody continue the discussion on the mailing list. So then next week we'll we'll do another. You, you know, it might make sense actually, Prem, next week to to try to focus maybe you know half the meeting towards the use case document again, assuming we have a pretty lively discussion this week. What do you think? Um, yes, makes sense. Uh, uh, makes sense. Uh, also depends on the number of comments. I got. I uh, did see comments from this. Uh, we, we also got some comments during the meeting from Daniel Bernier at Bell Canada, which is awesome. And some of his comments I think are really good. And some of the comments, either I misunderstand what's going on in the use case doc or he misunderstands what's going on in the use case doc. I'm not sure which. Because um, some of them he's like, we need to be, it's important that we can do X, Y, Z. And I'm looking at the going, I thought we could. Oh, I'm so confused. Okay. <laughs> so that'll be good. So yeah. that's good. So I mean, we need to clarify. So it, it's, you know, it's clear that we are yeah. doing and not doing. Yeah, just a minute update on what I've updated on the use case doc is that I've just added the distributed uh, bridge um, and then I've given uh, options on it. One is basically a full mesh, which is persistent and the other one is basically on demand. Yeah, that's a quick update. Cool. Okay. So Ed, I just copied this, this conceptual review section from the previous week. I don't know what what you want to do here with this? I, I you know this section is all this 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 has always been about um sort of of you know it, it, it it's just the whole idea with network service mesh it's very cool but it's a little bit different than, than folks have looked at the stuff in the past and it was just to provide some space for people to sort of talk through the concept it it feels like people are getting good traction on the concept um and so i'm, I'm okay with you well, that's probably because i haven't been here the last two weeks <laughs> 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 I, I do want to point out though, Mike, um, and I, I did you know, call you out among other people when I was expressing appreciation at the um, network service mesh meeting, that presentation, uh, sorry, the, the uh, SIG networking meeting, that presentation would not have been nearly as clear if you had not been uh, insistent on precise expression of the idea. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, yeah. So um, I think maybe the, I don't and maybe if you and I could just get some more time, I'm not sure we need to take everybody's time. No, uh, I, and I would be delighted to do that because I've been finding it very valuable. Um, but I suspect that it's valuable for you and it's valuable for me, but it may not so much be valuable for an audience. Yeah. So let's just find some time to talk directly. Cool. That makes sense. So I guess in, unless anyone has anything else, we may, you know, give everyone I have, back. Uh, I have hmm? uh, Few questions. Oh, um, sure. Go ahead, <laughs> That's what the session is for. <laughs> uh, so uh, the question is: so Assuming that uh, NSM is going to be the uh, local control plane or the SDN or whatever it is, um, I just want to start a discussion around how do we get the uh, relation between the BGP routes uh, to that of uh, 
how the mesh has to be created, um, things around that. Right, right. So, so I think what you're saying is you, you have something that, that is speaking BGP that is, is essentially you, you have some SDN that's interacting with BGP and how do right. we actually interact correctly? Right. Um, and, and, and my off the cuff is um, that whatever data plane plugin for NSM you had would be the thing that would be causing that to happen. So, you know, let's just take a, a, a for instance, right? And, and I, please note, this may or may not make even, even make any sense. You know, let's say that whatever you're doing involves locally manipulating, you know, you want to do this in a way that involves locally manipulating a data plane and advertising a bunch of routes to BGP, right? And so you build an NSM plugin that locally manipulates the data plane and advertises a bunch of routes to BGP. That's awesome. But I don't think NSM, the common NSM thing that's, that's across every NSM, I don't think that necessarily is something that should interact with BGP itself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, the reason I, I brought in that particular uh, discussion is uh, what in case if uh, the whole mesh uh, uh, gets created based on the requirement of what are the routes you need to expose or what are the routes you need to support? Would, 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 would that be a requirement uh, when we plug into such BGP speakers? Oh, so are you asking basically what routes get injected in the pods and how? Right. right. No, uh, okay, so sorry. Let me put it in simple terms, okay? That, that's, a, that's, uh, a, that's an interesting question, but not the one I thought you'd asked. Yeah, so to put it in simple terms, what I'm trying to say here is, uh, assuming that you start on a clean slate uh, with uh, with the service mesh, right? With the network service mesh. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create um, the the uh, VXLAN uh, tunnels between the uh, pods. And then once that is done, basically the channels gets exposed. Um, and how is it happening is basically based a bit of the pods requirement as well as what is the requirement from the external connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, when we bring in the external connectivity, uh, what is important is one is uh, the parts requirement access, meaning or the application requirement access. But there is also a requirement that is coming from the external world on what has to be exposed uh, and what should not be exposed, right? Um, that might be driven by policy, but when we talk about policies related to that of network, what matters is matters relates to what which of the parts have to be exposed to the external nodes and which of the parts should not be exposed, right? Um, so here, a bit of intelligence on how the, uh, a bit of intelligence on the policies, uh, mm -hmm. particularly the network policies would essentially help in creating the whole mesh. So that's what, what exactly I uh, mentioned here. And I use BGP just as a reference. Okay, so in, in my mind, there's sort of two things that are going on here. Um, and there are two, two places that you might have, what you might think of routing in, this, in the, the, the system. Um, one thing, one place you may have it is inside the pod. Um, it may, by virtue of having gotten a, a connection to a network service, it may need to have some routes to selectively send some of its traffic to that network service. So a really simple example of this is, imagine the network service I've been connected to is, a, um, is basically secure intranet connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something that lets me connect securely to my intranet for whatever the definition of secure is. Right. Um, and so it may be that when I get that connection, I should also be receiving a set of routes that say, okay, here are the prefixes you should be sending out uh, to the network service that is from the pod to the network service that is secure internet connectivity. Um, right. That's sort of what I'm calling the inside the pod routing. And, and mm -hmm. I've been thinking of that as something that comes back um, via the um, you know, connection accept uh, message. So, you know, the far end, the network service endpoint accepts the connection. It understands what addressing it would like people to have when it talks to them, what kind of traffic should be sent to it, et cetera. And that comes back to the, to the NSM, which can set that stuff for the pod. Um, that's kind of how I've been thinking about that right now. Now, then there's the secondary okay. thing that you mentioned, and that is literally, if I have a pod that's trying to connect to a network service, and I have a bunch of different network service endpoints that could provide it that service, how do I decide which one to connect it to? Right. And, and that's, that's what I think of as sort of the, um, the policy, the sort of connection policy stuff. I've been repetitively calling it, uh, you know, network service wiring and thinking of it as analogous to Istio's virtual service or route rules concept. Right. right. Um, okay. But I think if we look at those two things, 
then you can start asking yourself sort of like, how do you connect those to other systems? Does that make sense to everybody? I think broadly I'm following what you're saying. Oh, good. Yes. Hey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so I think that's what I want to perhaps. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. One, yeah, just, just to inject something real quick. One thing that we're probably going to have to build out um, is we're probably going to have to add something for that, that uh, turns some of these into a, into a shared library that SDNs can, can pull in. So for example, when you talk about how do you add a route, you know, well, in order to add a route, you have to spin up a container. That container has to have net admin then it has to run the correct uh, netlink commands or, uh, or otherwise whatever, whatever other uh, API calls against the kernel in order to set properly. And this, this would be a really good area to have a single location or uh, set of utilities that can, that can do this on behalf of, uh, of, of I, I, and not to say it's the only right way to do it. The way I had been thinking about this was not actually to have the SDNs do that. Um, the way well, I've been thinking about it, would, it would be the network service mesh likely or, yeah. yeah the, 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 the way I've been thinking about that was the NSM, the, the, the NSM is the one that operates on the stuff that goes into the pod based upon the response that it got um, from, you know, the things that it's interacting with, right? So if it, if it you know, gets back and it's told, the NSM understands from, it's pure NSM on the other end, for example, that, you know, these are the things that should be passed back. And I was seeing that coming through the accept connection. I actually have a picture for this that might help. One second. Yeah, and it could be the NSM as well. It could be some, maybe some set of labels or, or other information that gets tagged in that, um, that says, please inject this on my behalf. And that's, that's fine as well. We, we just have to have a mechanism that, um, that performs this because, you know, like the use case that Prem gave where you have BGP, uh, you have a new route that you need to support, but there's no easy way for, uh, for a, a NSM based library or uh, daemon running within the container uh, to inject, to inject in unless, unless you have a sidecar and I think we, we were, we're looking at eventually putting in a sidecar that would have net admin and then we could do it through there. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that occurs to me there is that, um, so when I think about this, you know, the, 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 all this stuff. So let's go back to the VPN example, not cause it's the only example, but it's, it's, it's sort of, um, it's instructive, right? So if, if I'm acting to connect to a secure internet connectivity service, and that ends up giving me a connection to some VPN gateway pod somewhere else, then it is the case that I would expect to be getting my route updates, not from an SDN, but from that VPN gateway pod, because it's the one that actually knows. Um, my SDN may or may not know, um, you know, unless it happens to be intimate with the VPN gateway pod. And so I, I think though what you did call out is the need to be able to dynamically update some of that information. Um, from the, the far end of the connection to the, the originator of the connection over time. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to, to point out. Like, I actually don't care where the information comes from as long as we provide a, an easy way for people to perform these operations that, um, that, that we can expose and we just make it very, very easy to, to inject these things in and we can we need to work out how we want to expose them and how much control do we want to maintain or versus how much do we want to to allow them to be explicitly called but ultimately i think that that's that's what we need is we need to have some like i i want to avoid getting different implementations to inject their own in their own paths and if we can get it to be coordinated through the NSM will be in a better will be in a better place. Yeah, and that, that was kind of how I've been thinking about the problem. Doesn't mean it's the only answer, but but coordinating through the NSM was definitely how I've been thinking about the problem. Um, cool. So we're at the top of the hour. I do want to be respectful of folks' time. I do appreciate all of you uh, coming uh, and all the folks who are starting to participate in push code. That's awesome. And I will see you all next week. Yep. Sounds good, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.